about RNA binding proteins. I'd like to start off by uh, thanking the organizers uh, for allowing me to present my research today. And uh, I'll just get right to it. The binding of proteins to specific sites along RNA sequences can lead to some of the most striking biological phenotypes, including mRNA localization and alternative splicing. And there are over 1,400 RNA binding proteins identified in humans, but many of these are not well characterized. So the larger question I'm interested in addressing is what are the sequence and structure preferences of these RNA binding proteins? And I'll refer to these as RBPs. We could study the binding properties of RBPs with affinity selection experiments, uh, like with things like ClipSeq, and we can do it also in vitro with assays like RNA Compete. The basic idea of RNA Compete is we're going to start with a diverse pool of short RNA sequences, let it interact with the protein of interest, do a pull down of that protein, and then we can count the number of RNAs that are bound versus uh, not bound, and this provides us with a quantitative binding score for each uh, sequence. And there are 244 RNA compete experiments that cover over 200 unique RBPs, and uh, this covers a wide range of RNA binding protein families, so it's a very comprehensive data set. The traditional uh, ways to analyze these kinds of data is use, usually uses things like HAMERS or position weight matrices, and there are also deep learning approaches as well. And I don't have time in the short talk to discuss the details of each of these methods, so suffice it to say that each of these methods uh, set fundamental constraints on the number of features, the sizes of the features, and also these previous models don't tend to uh, include the spatial information of the features, which turns out to be very important. So I, was, uh, I wanted to challenge the assumptions made by these previous models and design a neural network that's the more general flexible feature detector. And we call our model residual bind. Residual bind um, builds features hierarchically, so we're less sensitive to the numbers and sizes of the features because it can assemble them uh, combinatorically. And it also maintains general spatial positions of the features. And so here's a performance, uh, a comparison of our method residual bind versus uh, a bunch of previous methods. Each data point here is a different RNA compete experiment and is a piercing correlation between the model predictions and the experimental binding scores on held out test sequences. And you can see that our model does significantly better than these previous methods. But one thing that I've learned in dealing with neural networks over the past several years is you shouldn't get too excited from these performance improvements because neural networks can take shortcuts that you didn't consider, essentially exploring some flaw in the data set. And so it's really important to go back and validate what these neural networks are learning. And there has been progress on this front. Uh, one class of methods is called saliency analysis. The basic idea is that you calculate the derivative of the prediction with respect to the input sequence. And what this provides you with is the sensitivities of each individual nucleotide variant and how that affects that prediction. So if a nucleotide variant isn't very important, then it'll have a derivative close to zero. And if that nucleotide variant is, is favorable, then it'll have a positive derivative. And if it's unfavorable, it'll have a negative derivative. And we can represent this saliency map that we get out for a given sequence as a sequence logo. So I was curious to understand why residual bind is performing so much better than these previous methods. Is it learning a new motif or a better representation of a motif that the previous models were unable to capture? Uh, for validation purposes, I'm going to focus on um, an RNA compete experiment for RBFOX1 because it has an experimentally verified motif, UGC-AUG. Here's a scatter plot of the experimental binding scores versus the predicted binding scores. <coughs> Excuse me. Each data point is a <coughs> different test sequence, and it's colored by the number of mismatches of the best matching subsequence to the canonical motif. I want to guide your eyes to these three uh, data points uh, that have high binding scores, because they all have high binding scores, yet they, each of these sequences has a different number of mismatches to the canonical motif. So we can employ saliency analysis to try to understand what's going on underneath the hood. And this shows you that our model learns that a single intact motif at the top here is sufficient for a high binding score. And these other two sequences with mismatches have more instances of their suboptimal motifs, which collectively increases the overall binding score for that given sequence. Now, this shows you that saliency analysis is, is, is very powerful, but it can only be performed on an individual sequence basis. So we have to physically look at individual examples and try to deduce what we think the neural network is learning. 
And this isn't always uh, trivial because uh, sometimes these saliency plots are, aren't going to be so interpretable, and I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. So I developed a method to directly test hypotheses that we formulate from saliency analysis. The base, and we can do this with in silico experiments. The basic idea is that we can embed hypotheses patterns into null model sequences and send them through the neural network and uh, get out the predictions. What this provides you with is, uh, it's, it, it provides you with the importance of that specific feature um, while controlling for uh, background noise and confounding signals. And if you systematically alter the hypothesis pattern that you embed, you can start to map out function, uh, specific functions that the neural network has learned. So here's an example of that on the left here, where we embed different numbers of motifs into, some, into random RNA sequences and send it through the network. And you can see that our, 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 our neural network learns that um, each additional mo each, um, each additional motif contributes an additive model. Uh, and, and it's linear here, but uh, I've also um, ex you know, found that other RBPs can exhibit nonlinear behavior. So this is a nice way to explore whether your uh, protein exhibits phenomena like cooperativity. And from the saliency plots, I also noticed this other uh, pattern, this UGCAUGCAUG, which looks like two overlapping motifs. And I would imagine that if, you know, if one of these sites is bound, it could potentially sterically block the other site from binding. So I would imagine that it, could, it would have a lower binding score compared to if these two binding sites are well separated. But I would imagine that this overlapping motif uh, should still have a higher binding score compared to a sequence with just one site because there there's still are uh, you know, more chances for binding. So we can embed all of those patterns into our synthetic sequences into our random synthetic sequences, and um, you can see below that <coughs> a residual bind learns a function that's consistent with our biophysical expectations of steric hindrance. Now, RNAs can fold into secondary structures, and we know that it can affect the affinity of a binding site. Previous models that employed KMERS and uh, PWMs have found that including secondary structure predictions as additional features has helped their model's performance out significantly. So I was curious to see whether it would help our model too. So I calculated, um, I used RNA PL fold, PL fold to calculate the probability that each nucleotide is paired or unpaired, and we retrained our models on this additional data, with these additional features, but we didn't notice any improvement in our models across all of the RNA-compete experiments. And this was surprising because we know there are, 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 are RNA-binding proteins that have um, secondary structure preferences in this data set, uh, such as VTS1. VTS1 binds to the sequence motif CNGG in the context of a hairpin loop. So we can perform saliency analysis, try to understand what's going on here. Here, I'm, uh, we, we have two sequences with a high binding uh, score, and, and Performing saliency analysis, you can see that the CNGG motif is present there in the center of the sequence, but there are all these other nucleotides that are sort of uh, important as well. And it's unclear what these, what these other nucleotides represent. So now I'm going to perform saliency analysis with the model trained with the secondary structure profiles, and you can see that the sequence motif is much cleaner. And those other salient nucleotides seem to be shifted now onto the U's and P's below, which represent unpaired and paired. And you can see that this motif is in the unpaired region flanked by paired regions on both sides, which represents a hairpin loop as we would expect for VTS1. We also perform saliency analysis on low affinity sequences, low binding score sequences, and you can see that they also have the CNGG motif, but they're in the stem region now of the hairpin loop. So the fact that our neural network's performance doesn't improve whether or not we include the secondary structure information suggests that it may actually be learning these secondary structures directly from the sequence, which is surprising because we're using a convolutional network with these big, bulky convolutional filters, and it has to learn individual sites and learn these base pair rules uh, at, at specific positions. So um, we wanted to test whether our network can actually learn secondary structures from, from sequence, so we generated a synthetic data set with random RNA sequences and RNA sequences with a hairpin loop, and we just had our, uh, the same residual by network predict whether that sequence has a hairpin or not. And, of and it performs really well, and <coughs> but, what, um, but I mentioned that we, we should always go back and validate what the neural network has learned. So uh, we performed 
<coughs> we perform saliency analysis on a sequence with a hairpin loop, and the nucleotides that are important light up right in the stem region of the hairpin loop, and that's shown with the black bars underneath. But this still doesn't tell us whether the neural network is learning specific base pair rules for individuals uh, between two different uh, positions. So with the help of uh, Stefan Paul, uh, an undergraduate researcher at Harvard, we developed a method called second order in silico mutagenesis. The basic idea is that for a given sequence, we're going to take two positions and generate all possible pairwise mutations for, uh, for those two positions and send those through the neural network and get out the predictions. And we can organize those predictions as this uh, four by four matrix for positions one and two. Now, if these two positions should be directly base paired, should be directly base paired, then um, then we'd imagine that complementary nucleotides shouldn't, uh, shouldn't change the predictions. Whereas if the nucleotides would break a hairpin loop, then we'd expect the predictions to decrease. And that's represented as this pattern here. So we performed the second order in silico mutagenesis for positions 6 through 16 against positions 24 to 34. And those are the stem regions. And you can see that the diagonal elements are the only positions that really uh, show this base pairing rule. So, uh, our neural networks are, can learn these secondary structures from, uh, from just sequences. And finally, I'd just like to mention that we noticed that, uh, across a lot of these RNA-compete experiments, there was this strange little GC content uh, saliency on the right side, on the three prime end of the sequences, and it was unclear what, these, what this really represents, whether, how important this is. So we performed, uh, we, we generated um, synthetic data where we uh, had sequences with the motif and we send it through the network and we also had the motif with the GC content on the three prime end and you can see that it significantly uh, increases the predictions. And when we move that GC bias on the left side on the five prime end, that, that effect uh, disappears altogether. So we, we noticed this on 170 out of the 244 experiments, so it suggests that it probably isn't a RNA, property of RNA binding, but more likely uh, a, a, you know, some bias with the experiment. And so with that, my time is up. Um, you know, uh, everything that I mentioned in today's talk can be found in our, our archive that we just uh, recently uh, uploaded a few months ago, and I'm also going to shamelessly plug another bioarchive if you're interested in understanding how convolutional neural networks learn representations of sequence motifs and how to design them so that they actually learn motifs in the first layer filters. That would be a good paper to read. And thank my collaborators, and uh, please visit uh, Stefan Paul's uh, poster if you want to um, learn more about these neural networks learning more complicated RNA secondary structures, including pseudonauts. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Questions? Oh, so, so have you also tried uh, the neural networks in a generative mode? Excuse me? Have you tried the neural networks in a generative yes. Uh, mode? Yes, uh -huh. yes, I have. And uh, what do you find in terms of uh, the nature of the motifs that are generated when you do that? I haven't done it for motif, uh, for motif problems, no. I, I've, I've done generative models on other sets of problems. But uh, in, in, in cases like this, discriminative models using supervised learning tend to find motifs much, uh, much better. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, because I was wondering, like, uh, in terms of uh, what the neural network is actually, uh, actually learning, whether by doing a generative uh, uh, model, you could see actually what kinds of motifs it comes up with, and you could see uh, how those are biased towards uh, maybe certain things, because then you could see like uh, exactly what, it, what is it learning. Yeah, um, I mean, these are other, so there, I would say there's kind of different problems. Uh, we can talk about this oh, offline okay. if you oh, want. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.